for Wednesday, February 24th, 2021. My name is Drew Clark. I'm editor and publisher of Broadband Breakfast. Very happy to welcome you here for another episode of our uh, ongoing discussion series. We've been doing this for nearly a year. It's hard to believe we started with the uh, you know, the onset of the coronavirus and wanted to have a means for connecting people in the broadband community. Our focus at Broadband Breakfast is on better broadband, better lives. And so we take that seriously in terms of getting higher capacity broadband, but also how that broadband is used. And one of the key issues in the, the debate and discussion around broadband technology and internet policy today is, of course, the power of big technology companies and uh, whether that manifests itself in terms of concerns about social media, concerns about moderation on, on platforms, Section 230, all of these privacy issues, these are all concerns that are very much part of what we cover here at Broadband Breakfast. And today we're gonna be talking about antitrust, the consumer welfare standard and big tech. Just, just a few, few more words before we turn to our, our excellent panel that we have. Um, we try to cover topics broadly on Broadband Breakfast. We also go deep, but even though I am an attorney and work in the field of telecommunications and broadband, I certainly don't have the depth of knowledge that our three experts have for this discussion and of course other topics that we have. So we're really happy to bring them in to have their expertise and insights as we talk through some of these issues associated with with the consumer welfare standard and 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 big tech uh, as as one of course of the the topics that we we focus on here at Broadband Breakfast next week on uh, March third we'll be we'll be taking a very different topic about design product and execution for rural broadband deployment and again we'll we'll continue to cover wireless topics we'll cover other aspects of broadband's impact these are all part of our our ambit here at Broadband Breakfast. I'm going to go ahead now and turn to each of our four panelists. I'll open up the, uh, the view for all of them. Uh, the first uh, to speak will be uh, uh, former acting chairman Maureen Olhausen of the Federal Trade Commission, and she's currently the chair of the Global Antitrust and Competition Practice at Baker Botts. Uh, chairman Olhausen's actually uh, a, a graduate of, of my uh, alma mater, George Mason University Law School, and I remember her from those those days. And and uh, very happy that you are going to be with us and share some of your insights in this subject, uh, Chairman o Olhausen. She'll be followed by Avery Gardner, and Avery is General Counsel and Senior Fellow for Competition, Data, and Power. I mean, that's such a cool title, Senior Fellow for Power at the Center for Democracy and Technology. She'll go next and uh, get, give us some of her great insights on this topic. And then uh, batting cleanup will be uh, Jeffrey Manny, who's president and founder of the International Center for Law and Economics, and obviously very uh, knowledgeable and outspoken on this topic. So with that, let's turn it over to Chairman uh, Olhausen, our subject for today, of course, is how lawsuits have been filed against tech platforms, Google and Facebook, and uh, Congress is going to actively consider. In fact, yesterday, Chairman Sill of the House uh, uh, Antitrust Subcommittee of the Judiciary Committee has said he's coming forth with new legislation. Senator Klobuchar has already introduced legislation. So there's, there's lawsuits, there's uh, Congress uh, potentially act on this, but undergirding much of this discussion and debate is the question, what role should the consumer welfare standard play in assessing harm to consumers? So that's what we're gonna drill into now. And without any further ado, let's turn it over to you, Chairman Olhausen. Thank you for being with us and for your thoughts. Oh, great, Th thanks for having me. I'm delighted to be here and really looking forward to, to the discussion uh, with, my, with my fellow panelists. So um, look, antitrust is in the spotlight now, like you know, kind of like never, never before, not since a uh, hundred years ago, <laughs> really uh, with, with the progressives uh, back in, uh, in Woodrow Wilson in 1913, which really led to the creation of the Federal Trade Commission. Uh, but the question now, and you, you know, you talked about broadband and like all the issues that uh, that come to the fore about, um, you know, there's privacy issues, there's access issues, there's you know um, a whole host of other values that um, that come into play. And the question I think that's really being considered now is, 
is antitrust the right tool, antitrust as it's currently articulated, uh, to address some of these concerns? And what is antitrust really supposed to be doing? And then the question of should antitrust change do something else? So what, what can it already do and sh should, it, should it change? And you know, the consumer welfare standard has uh, really been, I think, beneficial to allow a lot of um, focus in antitrust law to say, what is antitrust trying to achieve? It is, uh, you know, the Supreme Court has said that the free market system is the best way to allocate resources in you know, uh, our society and that um, the antitrust laws are kind of the, the charter, the Magna Carta, if you will, uh, for, for, uh, for our free market system. So, so antitrust has been um, you know, articulated as being uh, trying to further consumer welfare, that it's consumers' interests that antitrust should be considering, not the interests of um, other competitors, not the interests of you know, industries writ large. It shouldn't be industrial policy where we say, oh, we want to you know, favor this industry or domestic industry or foreign industry you know, provider or, or something like that. But I think there's also been a misunderstanding that, can, that the consumer welfare standard only cares about price. That, that's not an accurate articulation of the standard. It actually is concerned about the various elements of the bargain or the product or the service, what have you, for consumers. So innovation has been considered, quality has been considered, you know, price, you know, obviously is a big, uh, is a big factor, but it's, but it's not the only factor. So looking at um, sort of the, that proper role of the consumer welfare standard has created, I think, a, a lot of common ground for um, uh, antitrust enforcers and, uh, you know, uh, and transparency in how decisions are made and how courts are going to review those um, those uh, enforcement actions by enforcers. So, for example, when I was the acting chairman of the Federal Trade Commission uh, for about a year and a half, uh, it was just myself and my Democratic colleague, Terrell McSweeney. And you would have thought that that would sort of be a recipe for gridlock, right? Um, but it wasn't. We actually agreed on many, many things. We brought a lot of enforcement actions and a lot of that agreement and change, uh, you know, having administrations change, not necessarily causing wild swings in enforcement is based on the idea that we have a common understanding what antitrust is supposed to do, right? That we're not there using antitrust to do, to address a whole host of issues that are apart from these consumer welfare identified issues. Um, and again, not to say that you know privacy and some you know some of these other issues aren't important. The question is, are we using the right, bringing the right tool to bear, uh, and is antitrust the right vehicle, or should there actually be other regulatory solutions put forth and more expert regula regulators uh, developing them and, and enforcing them? Because that's the other issue. As you start to say, well consumer welfare standard is too narrow, we should actually be putting in the interests of labor and we should have the interests of, you know, domestic, you know, um, industry versus foreign industry or, um, you know, environmentalism or, you know, equity or something like that. Um, that's a big burden to put on an antitrust enforcer to actually, you know, generally we have regulators with more specific expertise and knowledge who do that kind of thing. But, but if we shove it all into an antitrust analysis, you know, you're kind of presuming that the antitrust regulator is not only going to have that knowledge, but is able, going to be able to balance all of those competing factors and come to the right, come to the right outcome when reviewing whether it's a merger or conduct or something like that. So, so I think those are some important issues that are being considered. Um, and, you know, so again, I think the, the consumer welfare standard can address more than price, um, but I would be concerned about changing it to open it up to consider a host of factors that aren't directed to the, you know, the impact of the challenge conduct on consumers as consumers. Well, wonderful, excellent summary for us uh, about uh, the perspectives. And I, and I love how you were able to speak to, uh, it wasn't gridlock, right? With one 
Democrat and one Republican. I'm not sure that would be the same at all three letter agencies that begin with the letter F, but certainly the FTC showed us it could be done. Let's go ahead and turn it over to you. Uh, Avery, tell us a little bit about uh, CDT, the Center for Democracy and Technology, and some of your thoughts on this question here. Thanks so much, Drew, and uh, thank you for having me today. This is a really fun conversation with a spectacularly fun panel, so I'm delighted to be here. Um, at my organization, we focus not just on antitrust, but in all sorts of things about technology policy. And what we are trying to do is build a digital economy that works for everyone. So when I think about these issues, the lens I bring to it is one that puts the user first all the time. Uh, one of the things that we also care deeply about is when we say a digital economy that works for everyone, we mean everyone. So the uh, remarks you made at the beginning, Drew, about making sure that broadband is accessible and fast and up to the task is something that we care very deeply about. Uh, I agree with Maureen that uh, the consumer welfare standard can't be asked to carry too much water here. It already carries an awful lot, but I do think it's broad enough to think about putting all digital users first and prioritizing the needs of everybody. So I, I think we can do that. What I wanna talk about today is building on what we just heard about the consumer welfare standard and how it's evolved and what it means and trying to situate that in the practice of the last few years because we have an antitrust enforcement system in the United States. I'm actually on a one woman crusade to change every reporter's uh, notes when they write antitrust regulators. We don't have antitrust regulators in the US, we have antitrust enforcers. So how are those enforcers doing when it comes to enforcing the consumer welfare standard? And I have a couple of thoughts on that. Um, one is we think about mergers. This is part of the bread and butter of what DOJ and the FTC do. They review transactions over a certain size. The vast majority of them are competitively benign and nothing happens. And then when there are competitive problems that emerge, the agencies can sue to block deals, as you all know. I actually think that's going pretty well. Uh, they've got a pretty good win record when they do bring cases. I think their questions about individual cases perhaps going the wrong way. Uh, you know, I, from a user perspective, the Sprint T-Mobile one comes to mind for me is something that may be making it harder for people to access the, the promise of the digital economy. But as a general matter, I think that the agencies have been doing a great job in looking carefully at mergers in tech and beyond um, and trying to identify the ones where they should bring a challenge. Now, that being said, I'll also note that the Clayton Act standard on mergers sets a relatively low bar um, for the agencies to challenge in my view, but the courts and the agencies themselves have held themselves to higher standards recently in mergers. And so I think there's opportunity to do a little more on the merger front without actually the need for changing uh, the legislative standards. But here's where we've had a real problem. It's on single firm conduct, right? So uh, for those who aren't antitrust lawyers, that means what are big firms doing that could create problems? And if you've got an enforcement system, not a regulatory one, as we've got, then in order to make sure you are policing single firm conduct right and making sure that the consumer welfare standard is being brought to bear for American consumers, you have to bring some cases. And until October of 2020, that just wasn't happening, right? If you look at the DOJ's workload statistics, you'll find that they didn't bring any single firm conduct cases in 2019 or 2018 or 2017 or 2016, unless you think this is a political thing, it's not. Didn't bring them in 2015, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10. There was one brought against a hospital system in Wichita, uh, each Wichita Falls, Texas, I believe, population 134,000. Um, but before that, there was nothing in 2008, seven, six, five, four, three, you get the idea, right? We have not been bringing enforcement cases when it comes to single firm conduct at DOJ. The FTC's track record is a, a smidge better, but you can still count them on about one hand. So we're not doing the enforcement work that I think we need to do. And to me, it's so important to think about why we have enforcement. We have enforcement in order to stop the conduct by a firm that's doing something bad, right? But we also have it for its deterrence value, uh, that it sends a message to other people about what is okay and what is not okay in terms of actions by very powerful large firms. And deterrence doesn't work if you don't know what's against the law 
and you think that you're going to get away with it, even if you screw up. Uh, and when we don't bring cases, we put companies in that position of not knowing what's illegal and then not really having much of a deter deterrent value because we bring so few cases. So I would like to see us re-operationalize the consumer welfare standard to use its power to address issues of quality and innovation in addition to price. But to do that, I think we've got to do a couple of things. Um, one, we need to bring more cases that challenge single firm conduct. Two, we need to bring more scary cases. Um, and what I mean by scary cases is the agencies have to be willing to lose. It's a really hard thing. And I'm imagining Maureen, that when you were at the agency and you had limited resources, you were careful to try to bring cases that you thought you could win, which is a very rational thing to do. So we've got to give the agencies more resources so they can bring more cases. And we've got to give them the space to bring scary ones and not call them in for oversight hearings if they happen to lose one. Losing cases can be good. It helps figure out where the rules are, right? And where the lines are. So more cases, more scary cases. And then I'd like to see a lot more speeches and guidelines issued uh, by the new FTC and DOJ once there's an AAG in place about what they consider to be behavior that's over the line or not over the line. Because again, if you don't tell companies what the rules are, it's very, very hard for them to adhere to them. And then the fourth thing, um, and I'll close with this, is maybe we need more legislation. And I say maybe because I don't think we know yet. We've, read, we've had so many, I'm sorry, so few cases interpreting section two of the Sherman Act, that single firm conduct standard, that we really don't know what the courts think about it. And it's hard to say we need new legislative standards until we've seen that there are a lot of losses. Now, I also don't wanna to wait too long to make sure that consumers are getting the right uh, deal here. So there is a, there's a balance of um, doing more cases and helping us fill in any gaps legislatively and not. But particularly when it comes to the way our economy is changing, you know, folks are going to think back to the Supreme Court's Colgate decision in 1919. And I know you've all got chapter and verse of that memorized, but for those who might not, um, that was a case that kind of said from the Supreme Court that big firms can choose who to do business with if they want, and they don't have to do business with companies when they don't want to. And that has been the law of the land for 100 years now, 102 years. Um, I think that as we consider a new emerging digital economy, we have to ask some questions about whether markets are more prone to tipping and to winner take all, take all type phenomenon than they were back in 1919 when we had the Colgate decision. And I don't want to prejudge the answer to that because I don't know it. But I think that we are seeing some, uh, some of the impacts of things like scale economies and network effects that might make us say, wait, do we want to change the rules on what the largest, most powerful companies that can act as gatekeepers can do? Or is the set of rules that we've got really working for consumers? I think that's a question that can be taken up uh, by the Senate and the House, and also by the agencies, uh, again, through speeches and guidelines and potentially workshops. So I'm not advocating for a, a wholesale change or to eliminate the consumer welfare standard, but I think we can do some work to examine how it's functioning in the digital economy that we've got today. And uh, with that, I'll close and I look forward to discussion and questions. Excellent. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Let's turn right away to Jeffrey Manny to give your uh, thoughts and responses before we dive into questions. And I've got uh, quite, quite a few of them here now. Sure. Uh, thanks, Drew. Thanks so much for having me. And uh, thanks to Avery and, and Maureen. Um, so I thought I would uh, respond to a couple of points that have been raised, but but mostly uh, try to raise some additional thoughts before we go into discussion. Um, the, the first thing I would point to is the um, absolutely correct notion that Avery raised that we have an enforcement system. Uh, not a regulatory system. And I think that's very much to our advantage. Um, I think the, the way the antitrust laws have evolved through a common law-like process in the courts um, has proven to be, <clears throat> has proven to be uh, an important part of their success in the United States. Um, most importantly, because they have incorporated economic learning in a way that would virtually never happen if we had very static laws and um, very limited 
uh, discretion on the part of, of judges to interpret how the law should be enforced. Antitrust is inherently an economic exercise. And, and, and honestly, that gives rise to a lot of the concerns that people have. Um, uh, but Avery is absolutely right, I think, to point to the fact that that such a um, such a regime does require the inputs in order to to evolve and, and produce the outputs. And we have to have cases. Um, so, but what I think is is really important to note is that um, I don't know that having more cases would really get us to a different place than we are now. Um, I, I think that. Uh, the, the, a lot of the people who are who are advocating for big changes to antitrust wouldn't be satisfied with more enforcement actions unless the outcome went the other way, unless there were a an, what I would say is an overriding of much of the economic learning that we have, because I think the process has become inherently or there is an effort to make it an inherently politicized um, endeavor, as Maureen suggested. Um, so, and and by the way, the 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 point you met, mentioned uh, that Avery mentioned at the end about about big tech companies gets to this as well. I think when you start to unpack the uh, the problems that many people ascribe to these big, big tech companies, they aren't inherently economic problems. They are um, they are problems where uh, that that may come down to different political preferences, different ideological priors, and the like. Um, these things are not well suited to adjudication by the, the courts because they're not in, in inherently, um, because they are inherently political questions that should be determined by the legislature. Um, my concern is the efforts to um, sort of square the circle. And um, uh, we have legislation like on the part of uh, Amy Klobuchar, which purports to sort of lower the standards for enforcement on with a, a sort of and um, overtly explicitly trying to suggest all we're trying to do here is get to more cases really let's have more outcomes and let the courts figure things out um, except I think um, uh, it is legislation it is inherently political and it, it is not in the service of protecting competition it is in the service of promoting a particular political vision that in this case happens to virtually explicitly undo the consumer welfare standard. When it comes to those exclusionary conduct cases, the single firm conduct cases that Avery mentioned, the Klobuchar bill would essentially, um, in the in, again, in the name of trying to make enforcement more effective, uh, would essentially have the outcome of antitrust cases turn on the effects on particular competitors rather than on consumers or the competitive process. And I think we need to be really, really wary of, of uh, a return to that sort of state of affairs, the state of affairs that actually did prevail in antitrust uh, before the, really up until the 1960s and 70s. Um, excuse me, I don't think there's any reason to think that that will actually serve consumers well or the social welfare particularly well. To the extent that we have concerns about other issues as, as we've discussed, um, I'm sure that there are mechanisms for incorporating those into the law, but tying them to problematic judicial decisions or even lax enforcement, I think is really, really tenuous. And so I'll end with one, one final point, um, or actually I have two final points. One, one final point to, in, in response to that point that Avery made about the um, amount of enforcement. I think it's we have to be really careful not to be counting cases as a measure of the efficacy of enforcement. Um, the regime is inherently one of deterrence. The, the more clear the rule is, the less likely you are to have the problematic conduct occurring, um, and the less likely there is to be enforcement because the less likely there is to be bad conduct to enforce against. Um, so it's well understood that, that you can't just count cases in order to assess the efficacy of the, uh, of the regime. Um, that doesn't mean that we couldn't be under enforcing and, and many people virtually every, the one place of agreement in this whole realm is everyone thinks there should be more uh, resources for the enforcement agencies to the extent that 
that there's under enforcement because the agency because the economy has grown faster than the, the uh, agency's resources to keep up with it. Sure, by all means, let's put enforce let's put more money there if we think that's more important than the alternative uses to which that money could be put. Um, let's not forget that allocation of resources in the federal government is very much a political decision. So we shouldn't assume that our world is the most important, but it is very important. But we can't count the cases to see the, the consequences. We have to recognize also that there is a lot of enforcement coming from other places that establishes case law that has precedential effects. So there's a lot of private litigation. Um, and some of the most important antitrust cases in the last decade or so have been uh, private cases. There's one in front of the Supreme Court right now, as a matter of fact. Um, uh, uh, there are state attorneys generals bringing cases, and there is a lot that happens in the nature of guidance. And I agree with Avery as well that we could we could stand to have more public guidance. But I think companies that are potentially engaged in conduct that they're concerned about um, have good reason to um, think that they have a decent understanding of what the law would be, the likelihood of enforcement, and have some capacity. I I don't want to go suggest this is very significant, but some capacity to get advice from, from agencies, to have some indication from the agencies of what could be problematic or not, if, which if conveyed successfully means that there may not be enforcement because the conduct may not be undertaken in the first place for fear that there would be enforcement. Um, so I think at the end of the day, more enforcement is important in a regime that is that turns on enforcement. Um, but the concurrent legislative solutions to try to get more enforcement, I think are horribly misguided. Um, and we have to be really careful about uh, assuming that the problems that we're seeing are a consequence of insufficient enforcement, because it's really hard to say, even when enforcement is very low, that it's actually insufficient. Right. Well, thank you. thank you for that. So let's, let's dive into the question of price that uh, Chairman Olhausen raised and you said that uh, the consumer welfare standard does not simply require a focus on price. There can be innovation, there can be quality. Let's talk a little bit about that. How does that work, uh, Chairman Olhausen and, and the others as well? What does it mean for a consumer welfare standard to take other things besides price when the price is free for a lot of these goods, right? Um, yeah, so, so well, first of all, I, I... The idea that the price is free for a lot of these goods, I think, is a little bit of uh, myopic because there's somebody's paying a price somewhere, right? And so often the agencies, when they're looking at these things, are looking in, in a two sided market, um, you know, on the other side of the market. So, for example, you know, I may get a lot of online services, quote, free to me, but, you know, they're selling advertising space, right, to fund that. And that, that is where you can detect you know, a, pr a price effect uh, if there's something any competitive going on. But the agencies have challenged um, mergers uh, based on innovation effects, based on, you know, reductions in quality and, and things like that. So, th so that definitely has, uh, has occurred. So that, that's, not anything, uh, that's not anything unusual. Um, so, um, but, you know, kind of, uh, I appreciate um, uh, Avery and Jeff's comments um, a lot. I mean, I, I do think that um, the question of has there been enough conduct enforcement and is it sort of the, uh, the solution to adopt something like the Klobuchar bill that really, like if you have a 50% share in some market, right? It doesn't have to be a big company. You can be a, a company that has a 50% share in a small market, a regional market, that now we're going to say, well, we know it's better for consumers and we know it's better for, you know, this whole host of, you know, price and non-price attributes to say, well, now you're going to uh, be required to, um, you know, provide your resources, assets, IP, I don't know how, how IP even fact would be treated under this. Um, I think, uh, uh, I think, that's that's a big leap, um, <laughs> and 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 one of my other concerns was so much of this debate was happening focused on four big platform companies, or well, I mean it's even hard to say they all are in the same market, right? You know, some make devices, one's a retailer, you know, <laughs> search engine, um, you know, social social network, and 
and then take that as a basis to say, well, because this legislation that's being proposed is in no way limited to those companies. I'm not sure how it could be, but now it applies throughout the whole economy. Um, so, so I think that that is also, um, you know, should be grounds for a little bit of concern. Like, was the, you know, the report, the House report, or the hearings, you know, does it justify solutions that would apply to every company, large and small, similar or wildly unsimilar to the ones that were examined? Let me just jump in. I, I, I definitely want to hear the others, but, but say like, there's certainly, that we could almost draw a line between things that are accepted by, by most or all people. I, I'm hearing from all three of you, namely what, what is you know, called market share, right? You know, and the merger enforcement, if there's a horizontal merger that brings too much of a share into one party's hands, that's going to be blocked, presumably a monopolization case, a section two under the Sherman Act. Sherman Act, of course, being the landmark 1870 law that that put this into place. Section one, the other the other verity I would take it we'd all agree to is that you know a, a market division, a cartel, uh, a, a fixing prices. That's also kind of verboten, right? And and very little controversy that those two things, mergers that have market share and and um, price fixing, are bad and and beyond the pale. What I heard Avery raise earlier was the essential facilities doctrine. You may not have used that term, right? The, the Colgate case. And that is one of these seven items in the Buck report, the minority report of the House uh, Judiciary Committee that they put on as potential grounds for collaboration, right? Number, item number, uh, number uh, uh, whatever, uh, I, I numbered them here, but they said, um, uh, re revitalizing the essential facilities doctrine. That's a, that's a common ground item between Republicans and Democrats. So let's kind of move beyond the things that we're all going to agree to. Price fixing is bad and, and horizontal shares are going to be too great. Let's talk about essential facilities, revising that. Let's talk about vertical uh, integration because that's also often at a root of this. So Avery and Jeff, now, now I'll let you respond to that question, but I, I want to get to these other things that are not going to yeah. be part of the verities, right? Well, let me just quickly point out that the um, uh, aspects of the Klobuchar bill that, that Maureen was talking about um, nominally would address, you know, exclusionary conduct would incorporate the essential or the, the duty to deal uh, against which the essential facility doctrine is, is often um, proposed. And um, uh, so you could say the Klobuchar bill would have a significant, would be a significant way to revitalize the essential facilities doctrine, but for reasons Maureen was was saying, it would be a terrible way to do it. Um, first of all, I, I think revitalizing essential facilities doctrine would be terrible, full stop. But uh, the way the Klobuchar bill does it, again, with this sort of move away from uh, a focus on consumers, uh, um, leads to the notion that anytime um, you, you have, a, you have a, a, a very strong presumption in any market, anytime a, a competitor has been harmed by your conduct. Um, and, and if you're of a sufficiently large size, you have an almost inviolable presumption that the conduct is anti-competitive. Um, competition, pro-competitive competition hurts competitors. Uh, so, so this seems like a, a, a really bad standard to use if your objective is to promote competition because almost by definition, you'll be you'll be making illegal some conduct that would promote competition just because it hurts competitors. And I think that's a really significant um, um, way to sort of tie these two things together. I think that the House report, the Buck report, the Klobuchar bill, most of the complaints that we're hearing are born on the backs of um, assumptions about what happens to users and consumers and somewhat verifiable, you know, observable negative effects on certain competitors or other business actors. Those negative effects are not necessarily the result of anti-competitive conduct. They are just circumstances of, they could just be circumstances of competition that those competitors don't like. So you, you, you see, for example, um, uh, um, that's a good case. Uh, actually, the, the I'm sorry to switch continents, but the the Google Shopping case in Europe um, was brought by a number of uh, or was was raised by a number of so-called vertical search um, uh, providers, shop comparison sites on the internet, uh, who 
depended on traffic from Google to go to their sites. And then Google all of a sudden started offering its own comparison shopping. People weren't leaving Google's site to go to these other sites. They were suffering. And the claim was that that caused harm to consumers. Observable harm to those companies. No question those companies were losing traffic. Harm to consumers in no way demonstra- demonstrated, not even tried to be demonstrated in, in that case. And, and indeed, that's exactly the, what I see as the problem with the, the kind of the Klobuchar switch. It would allow harm to a, an inefficient, ineffective competitor that adopted a business model that was subject to the whims of another company. Um, it would allow that to substitute, it would allow harm to that company to substitute for a competitive analysis. And um, that is no way, that is not gonna serve anyone. It's not gonna serve those small companies, the other small companies uh, who would like the same shock that the previous small companies had. It's not gonna serve the large companies and it's not gonna serve consumers. Uh, let's, let's hear what Avery has to say. Thank you. Um, so I wish I was at my office and I could pull out the exact quote from Judge Easterbrook uh, many years ago when he was commenting that hard nosed competitive spirit and activity by powerful firms is either targeted against their competitors or in an effort to serve consumers. And the tricky part is distinguishing which is which, right? He said it much more eloquently than I did, but I think that's one of the real challenges here is that hard-nosed, sharp elbow competition is sometimes great for consumers and is sometimes aimed at wiping out your competitors so you can stick it to the consumer later. How do you tell the difference? And that is not an easy question. Easterbrook couldn't figure it out and I sure as hell can't. But I do think that we need to think about type one and type two errors here, right? Okay, please explain what those are for, yeah. for our audience. We have, we have um, type one and type two errors are the, the difference between sort of a false positive and a false negative, right? Um, If you're really concerned about accusing somebody of anti-competitive conduct when they didn't actually do something, then you might not actually catch a whole bunch of conduct that could be troublesome. If instead you're willing to accept some of the false positives, it might deter more conduct, right? So for a long time, our courts have moved very strongly in the direction of let's never get it wrong. Let's put a high burden on showing how it affects consumers because it would be wrong to have a case that punished a competitor for doing something that was consumer friendly, even though a competitor got caught up along the way. We've had that for a long time. I wonder whether it's time to start accepting some false positive type one errors here as we try to figure out what the right answers are. And I think that part of what the Buck report does, and it's a, it's a wonderful report, I recommend it as bed night, uh, bedtime reading for everybody, is that it says, look, we've got to study some of this stuff. And the staff report um, from the House Judiciary Committee talks a lot about the need to overturn some of the Supreme Court precedents, particularly around that second prong of the Sherman Act on single firm conduct. What it doesn't do is tell us what to replace them with. And I think that's what the Buck Report does so nicely. It says, hey, things like predatory pricing, let's talk about that one and figure out whether the standard that's in the Brook Group case is not the right one, or let's talk about essential facilities. And I don't think we've done the hard work as antitrust practitioners and advocates to figure out whether we do need to make legislative changes to those. So I'm, I'm a fan of what, what Buck is talking about there. And then one more point and I'll stop, I promise. Um, a lot of the conversation that I'm hearing is about a fundamental difference in approach. Should we be looking at form or should we be looking at effects in antitrust cases? And the court cases have been moving us very strongly to looking at effects, uh, to looking at economic evidence of harm, right? And what people are talking about in terms of returning to structural presumptions and share levels is maybe moving away from that and towards something that says, if the form of the industry looks like that, it raises real concerns for us. So I think that's a debate we're gonna hear a lot more about. Can you just say another minute or so on the essential facilities doctrine, what, what it is, why it might have been bad and why it might now be good or important. Uh, I'll do my best to do that fast, but basically uh, we're trying to make, uh, figure out what the rules should be if you're a very powerful firm that has control of something that's important for your competitors in order to access markets or access consumers, right? Um, So the essential facilities doctrine is the notion that if you control something that is essential to getting out into the marketplace, there may be some obligation on you to share that facility with your competitors. 
it is still good law, right? So we talk about it being at or near the outer bounds of Section 2 liability, but it is still good law on the books. The problem is it involves a case involving ski resorts from the 1950s, and it's super hard to adapt ski resorts of the 1950s doctrine to the modern economy of 2021, and particularly tech companies. But I think some of the questions we're hearing in Europe particularly are very much the same sorts of conversations about essential facilities that we should be having here. Are there firms with gatekeeper power, right? And that word gatekeeper has become trendy recently. I think it is the modern equivalent of an essential facilities doctrine. And it's a question we should all be asking. Should we put a burden that is different on big companies if they control an essential way of reaching consumers? I don't think we have the answers yet. Yeah, Chairman Olhaus, I'd love your thoughts on this particular subject. Yeah, so, so the essential facilities um, doctrine, you know, it was created based on the idea that there was this bridge that went across the Mississippi River, which actually a coalition of railroads owned. So the idea was a single firm, it really doesn't even, you know, kind of hold up based on the doctrine. But the idea is that if there's something that is, you know, some competitor says, I have to have this to compete that there is some sort of obligation that then the for the entity that has that asset to share it. And it's it really, when you dive down into it, can create some very problematic ideas. So if you think about the Aspen skiing case, you know, to my mind, that was a case where you had a competitor who was offering this product to the whole world at a price that they had set by you know, the market. And the question there was, could they say, we're not going to sell it was lift tickets, we're not going to sell those lift tickets to the other mountain so that they can then package it with something so that skiers could come use, use that. So when you look at it in that way, and you say, okay, well, there is behavior that has absolutely no pro-competitive value, and that um, is other, the only reason an entity would engage in it the only benefit to it is the anti-competitive restriction on a competitor. You know, I, I think that's what the Aspen skiing case stands for. Um, and I think you can you can apply it. The problem is with when you start to talk about essential facilities, what that means, particularly outside the U.S., and I've been party to many conversations at conferences around the world, particularly in China, where people say, well, the intellectual property, that patent that you have, I need that because I want to make that product too, or I want to make a product that practices that art and it's essential. So you must license it to me. And then we have to license it to me on terms that I think are fair that allow me into the market. And the problem there, so IP I think presents it the most starkly, but it actually applies to the creation of any assets is what is the incentive we're creating or putting in place for that entity who created the IP or created the asset or the system or, or what have you to make it again. If their benefit of investing in it and making something successful is going to be forced to be shared once they're successful, everybody has to be allowed in, right? So we have this dynamic effect on innovation. So one of the things that I did when I was at the commission was People were saying, well, the belief that IP rights are important to innovation is faith-based. We, we don't really have any evidence of that. Even though it's in our constitution, right? The patent, <laughs> the right to patent, you know, our founding fathers saw, you know, understood the value of it. So I actually did a study and looked at, um, I wrote a paper, it's been published, um, that looked at over time what happened when the protection of IP rights varied, right? And what we saw was, over time, there was correlation, you can't say causation or correlation, that there was less investment. There was less investment in R&D activities. So that is the problem with a, an easy, like, you know, grabbing of the essential facilities doctrine for fair, for fair access, is you end up saying, um, well, will the next essential thing actually be invented? Because the, you know, the value of it, uh, for the long term is reduced to the entity that would have to be investing to create it. So I, I take it you disagree. Another, you disagree. 
Sorry, just I just quick quickly. I take you disagree that it's worth reconsidering. Is that right, Ch Chairman Olhausen? Well, what I'm saying is, if we really understand what Aspen skiing is about, and we find that, so if you look at like the Otter Tail case, right, which actually was about a utility saying that you know uh, uh, it's not going to sell power to you know an, uh, to an, another competitor, I think there is a narrow band where it makes sense. But my concern is it's being used very broadly, and eventually it will be used against American companies overall by foreign entities who say, I want your IP, because that's how I'm going to compete with you and get in the market. And we're not doing anything wrong because you, that's what you do in the US now. Jeffrey, go ahead. I, I think there's another aspect of this that is, is worth um, keeping in mind, especially with respect to the, the platform companies. Um, I, I like to analogize essential facilities to to sort of longstanding debates about the the openness of various systems, including platforms, an essential facilities argument is essentially one that says the platform should be um, should be more open than they are. There are lots of dimensions on which these claims come up, but essentially, the ability to control access or control the terms of access by a platform holder is deemed to be sort of you know, inherently problematic. And uh, the problem with that, one of the problems with that is exactly what Ma Maureen described, but another problem is um, platforms are, are very complicated. They are two-sided, many times multi-sided markets. And um, uh, you know, the, the, the platforms aren't just sort of dumb pipes and, and um, you know, simple pass-throughs. Um, they, they care very much about the terms of access and the terms of interaction on the platform. What's beneficial to one group of users, let's say, um, is invariably going to harm some particular type of user or group of users on the other side. If your platform, if you care about your platform, um, you know, having uh, no, let's say, no violence on it whatsoever. Um, if you're a, a, you know, Reddit or something like that, or if you want no pornography on your platform. And uh, you have, and, and you think that's beneficial for your users. And someone comes along and wants to have, wants to use your platform to promote pornography. They are obviously going to be harmed uh, by that. Um, and this is not a great example in the competition realm, but it's helpful in just uh, highlighting the point that that someone could be could be harmed or fail to have access to something that they deem necessary to their product. But the platform itself may be satisfying demand of a much broader group of people who may have very different uh, uh, set of concerns around what the product should look like. And um, one concern with the essential facilities doctrine type approach is that it takes that decision-making away from the platform. It's not to say the platforms do it perfectly and could never do that to try to harm competitors, but, uh, um, but assuming that anyone knows better than the platform when it's beneficial to the platform is, is extremely problematic. Well, so this, this quote, essential facilities argument is sort of veering towards a, maybe a more raw political concern that these, these things, Google, Facebook, whatever, should be utilities, right? They should be regulated. They're so powerful. They're so all encompassing. That sort of seems to be in the air, right? And, and, and I want to ask each of you your thoughts on how much of the angst we're hearing about the GAFA companies, Google, Amazon, Facebook, Apple, uh, is really owing to their own conduct versus um, maybe I should say their own contact that might be conduct that might be circumscribed by antitrust law versus privacy concerns versus concerns about social media and its impact on society, either in terms of polarization or in terms of you know uh, excessive attention and and or coarsening of, of the culture and any of these metrics we could use to to rate and measure. And so I, I want to let's start with Avery on this one is, to what extent are, are these concerns proxy for concerns about privacy and how would a privacy legislation kind of impact the discussion we're having around big tech? I love this question uh, because it actually makes me think back to my US history class uh, when I was 17 years old. And in that class, we learned about the progressive era, right? So we're talking about 1870s, 1880s. And then, of course, the Sherman Act becomes law in 1890. And in that period of time, there was extraordinary fear about the powerful becoming more and more powerful, right? So this is the era of the Vanderbilts. This is the time of political cartoons where the Senate 
uh, has a special door for monopolists and the public entrance has been closed in the political cartoons. There's real concern that workers are being exploited and underpaid. Um, there is uh, a party, a presidential party that comes into effect called the Anti-Monopoly Party that fields a candidate. Um, and you of course have uh, Republican strategist Hannah saying there are only two things that are important in politics, money and I forget what the second one is. And if you think about it, a lot of those same concerns are the ones we're hearing today, that the powerful are too powerful. They have power over politics, they have power over speech, they have power over things that we see and they're not treating their workers right. And it, it really does rhyme with what I see in the history books. And what happened, of course, in the progressive era is we got the Sherman Act in place, as well as a few other things like direct election of senators comes at around that time. Um, and I think now we're seeing that same pressure, pressure to use antitrust to fix all of these other problems that aren't really antitrust problems. So privacy, we have massive privacy problems in this country. We ought to have privacy legislation. It's a no brainer, right? Um, antitrust law can think about privacy on the edges as part of that quality competition, I believe. But fundamentally, privacy should be protected. Write a law to do that, Congress. Do it tomorrow, please. In fact, CDT wrote one. You could just adopt that one. It would be super. Um, so I think there is a lot of spillover here that for pure antitrust lawyers gets really frustrating because that's not what we were trained to think about. We were trained to think about price and quality and innovation. But as competition policy advocates, we need to find places for that energy to go uh, because otherwise it's going to come into antitrust and it's going to change the way that we think about antitrust law. So I think there's space for all of it. The question is, does it belong in antitrust cases right now under the current law? I'd really rather focus on what has been our traditional consumer welfare standard and figure out how to do a better job of um, identifying harms there, particularly on the innovation and the quality sides of the ledger, which are just harder to measure than price effects and uh, require some new thinking. Chair Malhausen, go ahead. Oh, no, I completely agree with what, what, what Avery said. Um, I, I think that, you know, there, and there are these frustrations. Uh, it's it very much echoes things things in the past, um, and that there are better tools to do it. But the other thing that I want to mention, and um, I'm glad Avery brought it up, is look, it's not that antitrust law should be stagnant and static, right? And should say we know everything now, or we knew everything as of you know <laughs> when, when, whenever, uh, and and we don't continue to learn. If there are competitive impacts any competitive impacts that are happening, um, we need to continue to refine our tools to, to address them and to, to challenge them. So kind of going back at the history of the FTC, um, the FTC and DOJ lost, um, I think eight hospital merger challenges in a row. And the courts were just not buying the agency's forecast that these were gonna cause consumer harm. So the agency went, the FTC went and they did a hospital merger retrospective and it showed that the anti-competitive impacts the agency was forecasting actually occurred in the market and laid down that foundation. And now the agencies have had a lot of successes in, in that area. Um, I also think that there are some cases that are single form conduct cases that are getting overlooked here. Think about the FTC's case against McWain, which got upheld in the 11th Circuit um, about uh, exclusionary practices um, on, um, on exclusive contracts. So I supported that case. It got appealed to the 11th Circuit, which isn't exactly a government-friendly circuit, but it got, it got upheld. There's, the FTC also did terrific work on pay-for-delay agreements and had to take that all the way up to the Supreme Court to win that case. But it, but it did. Um, so I, I do think those are good examples of how um, antitrust law can continue, to, even under current consumer welfare standards, continue to evolve to address um, any competitive behavior um, that is occurring in the market that maybe the first time around or a few times, uh, you know, not, not everyone saw it the way that the agencies did, but they, they ended up being, you know, vind vindicated. And I, I think those lay out some really good things. And just one last thing to talk about, um, and I'll, then I'll hand it over is, 
a guy wrote um, a, an article paper called um, Brother May I, The Challenge of Competitor Control Over Market Entry, because I do think that can be a, a challenge and I think it is addressable under current antitrust law. But again, I have concerns about throwing open the doors and saying, well, anybody who wants your, you know, access to your platform, IP, what, what have you, should have it. I agree with you and reply to that, yeah. Yeah, I, I thought that was um, beautifully stated, and I want to plus one it with an, another case, and that was the SureScripts case that the FTC brought um, a couple of springs ago. In that case, which was voted out of the FTC five to nothing, right? So all three Republicans and the two Democrats supported bringing this case against SureScripts. SureScripts is a company I had never heard of, but it powers the, some of the network mechanics that happen behind when your doctor gives you a prescription that gets um, filled at CVS and then charged to your insurance company. That magic that happens, that means you no longer have to carry the paper prescription to the drugstore is part of what SureScripts does. They, according to the complaint, have massive market share. And again, according to the complaint, uh, had taken steps to elbow out any potential competitors and monopolize the markets in a manner that the FTC thought violated Section 2 of the Sherman Act. And so I want to see more cases like that. And I think it, it speaks a lot to the power of the existing laws to do great things for us that that complaint was a 5 nothing vote. So our, our time has flown by, of course. Uh, nothing like an exciting topic like antitrust to, to, to pass the hour. I want to ask one final question that I'll let all three of you respond to. And a bit, bit of a long question, but looking at the Buck Report, right, and putting aside the no-brainers and the off-the-table crazy ideas, there are seven points they raise. I want to just mention each seven of these and invite all three of you to respond. Which of these really are, you know, uh, available or common ground? One is monopolization report, monopoly leveraging and predatory pricing. Two, the essential facilities doctrine I've already raised. Three, monopolization reform, product improvement. And I realize these are just bullet points shorthand, you know, but, but hopefully you've, you've read this and understand this. Point four, overriding Ohio versus American Express. And whoever wants to take that can explain extremely briefly that case. Uh, point five, merger reform, 40% dominance by seller and 25% dominance by buyer, rebuttable presumption. Just two more. Number six, merger reform, presumptive ban on future acquisitions and prohibiting acquisitions of potential rivals and startups. And point seven, merger reform, presumption that vertical mergers are anti-competitive, okay? That, that'd be a switch, obviously. Now, again, these are not what the Republicans said are off the table. These are things they said they can agree to potentially. So if we're starting with that benchmark, these are all things that Congress might pass, this Congress or our next Congress, because both parties and Democrat-controlled chambers uh, are, are presumably for them. So, Jeff, let's let you respond to any of those seven, and then Chairman Olhausen, and then Avery will give you the last word. Uh, sure, all of them are terrible ideas. Um, I don't know. I don't know why anyone thinks that there's anything approaching agreement on these, unless you take an agreement made from a purely political standpoint by people who have a particular objective in mind and don't really care about the economics underlying this, this these decisions and the the protection of consumers. Um, I'll, I'll take one at random, not at random, it's the first one, predatory pricing. The idea that, I mean, predatory pricing inherently benefits consumers, right? We I mean, we know that it's, it's lower pricing, good for consumers. Now, of course, there's this risk that down the road, somewhere in the future, someone could get rid of all the competitors and raise prices. And the courts have made it very hard to demonstrate that because it, it is actually something that should be hard to demonstrate because it, it, it happens only in very narrow and very difficult to, to identify um, circumstances. Um, and again, along the way, consumers benefit from lower prices. So we should be really, really careful about holding it to be illegal, presumptively illegal to lower your prices in the service of, of you know, elbowing out a competitor because that is precisely what competition looks like and differentiating it from harmful predatory conduct absolutely risks imposing huge costs on, on consumers for something that may actually never harm them, that may pr produce no benefit for them at all. Um, I mean, uh, and I have to mention the vertical uh, integration point. This is, this is, I mean, one area where there is, there is um, 
as close to consensus as you can get in economics is there's massive studies on this. There's the empirical and theoretical evidence all shows that most vertical mergers are competitively neutral at worst and competitively beneficial uh, often. There is no basis for suggesting the vertical merger should be presumptively illegal. That is as, as against the economic learning as, as just about anything you could imagine, except for something that impedes free trade. That would be the other thing. Okay. But, um, I, it's crazy. I, there's, there's no economic basis. For okay, okay I well, say, I have to say one tell us what thing. you really it think, Jeff. No, there can't be you know, noodling at the margins, but to suggest that these are in the same category as as or could be in the same category as you know increasing budgets for enforcement agencies, that's that's absurd. Sorry. Hey, Chairman Olhausen. So just kind of take a step back and look at sort of the flip side of the coin, which is antitrust law and the courts and everybody you know who talks about this has always said, well, we want to allow competition on the merits, right? We want to protect competition on the merits. That's really allowed. Once you have this long list of you can't do this, you can't do that. You know, it's like you can't grow, you can't improve products, you can't, you know, get out of your lane, you can't, you know, things like that. What is left on saying, well, how, what is competition on the merits? How is the company going to continue to compete if it is so straight jacketed that it can't do all of those things that would fall under that list? So I, I would be afraid of what we would be, what we would be losing by okay, so competition so severely. So you're pretty, you're it. pretty down on that list too, is what I'm hearing, Chairman Olhausen, right? <laughs> I, I didn't read the, the, the ones everyone agreed upon, which is kind of have gotten mentioned, more budgets for antitrust enforcement, right? Uh, I'm in uh, favor of more budgets. More budgets, uh, reforming, another was Says data enforcer. portability. <laughs> data <Former> portability. enforcer. <laughs> And there, there were others like data portability and interoperability, reforming burden of proof in merger cases. But, but again, let's let's focus on these because I I, I suspect maybe uh, Avery has some different thoughts on these seven. But let's let's hear from you as your final word here. Thank you so much. Um, I think that we do need to do a bit of d a deeper dive into what I hope we no longer call the essential facilities doctrine because that is kind of toxic in antitrust circles, but maybe it's something about access or gatekeeper power, which is becoming popular in the EU. I don't think we have the right answer on that yet, as I mentioned before, but I do think that the notion that there are um, there are bridges over the Mississippi that are essential to delivering products and services to consumers today that don't take the form of steel and iron bridges um, is, a, is a conversation worth having among enforcers and policymakers and advocates. Um, I also have to take a little bit of issue on predatory pricing. I believe with all my heart that low prices are good for consumers. So please know that I share your enthusiasm for low prices. But the Brook Group standard on predatory pricing has made it kind of impossible to bring those cases. And as we work in digital markets, where the marginal costs of producing things are often very different than they were 100 years ago, uh, as we're talking about digital goods, I think there's room for discussion and investigation there too, to see if there might be some modernizing of the predatory pricing laws. So again, to protect low prices, we want to encourage low prices, but we don't want predatory behavior that results in raising the prices back up after you've elbowed out all of your competitors. Well, that will have to be our last word. Uh, before I thank each of our panelists, I just want to remind everyone that we will be back next Wednesday, uh, March 3rd, with a discussion about design, product, and execution on Rural Digital Opportunity Fund Award winners. Uh, on behalf of our three panelists, Maureen Olhausen, uh, Jeffrey Manny, and Avery Gardner, I'm Drew Clark with Broadband Breakfast, and thank you for being with us here today.